Reading with your kids. Hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, assalamu alaikum, shalom, jumbo, bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. Coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. A beautiful little place to be. We are so happy that you're with us today. We have two wonderful guests. Nadine Pope will be here later in the show. You might remember her telling us about her Weenies and Bikinis books. But first, we will meet the author of If There Never Was a You, Amanda Rowe. You know, if there never was a love with food, then my wife never would have discovered this thing that she absolutely loves called lemon snackaroons. It, it came in our monthly love with food subscription box, and my wife just loves it. It's like lemony and coconutty and macaroony, and she just goes crazy. And she's just so happy that she's found this, so now she can go out and find it online and have it whenever she wants. Are you ready to make some great snack discovery, a healthy snack discovery for you and your family? Well, make sure you go to our website, readingwithyourkids.com slash yummy, readingwithyourkids.com slash yummy, and sign up for the most wonderful subscription service in the world, Love With Food. We also love the fact that with every box Love With Food delivers, they donate a meal to a needy family. Talk about win, win, win. And here's another win. When you go to readingwithyourkids.com slash yummy, you can get 40% off your first purchase at Love With Food. Check it out today. Support the podcast. Do good. Readingwithyourkids.com slash yummy. Joining us on the line right now from beautiful Bordentown in New Jersey. She is the author of a beautiful really heartwarming book called If There Never Was a You. Please welcome to the show Amanda Rowe. Amanda, how are you? Hi, Jed. I'm well. Thank you so much for having me today. So happy that you are on the show today. Uh, uh, I I just love the title of your book, If There Never Was a You. Tell us us about the story. Oh, thank you. Um, well, it's about making children aware of the important part that they play in our lives and the important role that they have in our hearts. It's really just about making them feel loved because I feel like as a parent, my most important job is to make my children feel loved because if I treat them with one respect, I feel like they're going to go out and treat other people that way. And that's the kind of people I want to raise, people who are building other people up and not tearing them down. Absolutely. And you know, I imagine there might be some people listening who will say, you don't have to say that. It's, it, you take it for granted. You know, there's, we, we feed them, we take them to soccer, we take them to school, we buy them clothes. They know that they're loved, but sometimes they don't. I agree. And I think especially when they're young, there's a lot of, you know, don't, don't do this, don't do that. No, don't touch that. And I think sometimes, you know, as parents, we're tired, we're busy, we might be a little bit stressed, and they pick up on that. And I wonder sometimes if that makes them think, you know, if they, as children, misunderstand and think that that means that we don't love them. So I thought this book would be a great way to sort of open up that conversation for families to be able to discuss the situation and say, you know, no matter how tired I am or no matter how busy mommy is, she loves you. And you are, you know, a wonderful addition to her life. Was there any one event that inspired you to uh, to write this book? Oh, that's a great question. Um, well, I, uh, yeah, I think so, actually. I got divorced about five years ago. Um, and, I, you know, I used to be a stay-at-home mom. So I was with my kids 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And then after I got divorced, I got a full-time job. Um, I split custody with my ex-husband. And so 50% of the time, all of a sudden, my kids weren't with me. Mm. And I really missed them. It was a really hard adjustment, you know, for all of us, I think. And so I started thinking, you know, well, there's a lot of parents who would give anything to have free time. Mm -hmm. You know, I tried to kind of put a positive spin on it. Like, well, what can I do with this time? You know, I have all this time. I miss my kids. How can I sort of channel that into something positive? And so I wrote this book for them, really. Whoa, so cool. You you know, you're right. This is, um, you know, something that's, that's happening more and more these days that, you know, families are, 
they're not the traditional families that um, that are depicted in the you know 1950s sitcom with the mom and the dad and 2.3 kids, and I always felt bad for that 0.3 kid. Um, <laughs> but you know, there are a lot. There are a lot of blended families. There are a lot of of uh, kids who are uh, you know. Sp- splitting time between two different homes and, you know, maybe more when we add in grandparents and, and it's difficult for kids. And, uh, yeah, sometimes I think we do need to make the conscious effort, even, even with kids in that traditional, um, home to make time, make, make time to make sure that we let the kids know that we love them. Yes. Yes. Agreed. I always tell my children, you know, if I'm ever frustrated or I, I seem, you know, in a bad mood. It's not about you. You are the bright spot in my life. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm always happy, even if I feel, you know, if it seems like I'm tired because I, you know, I went to work and then I drove you to soccer practice and then I made you dinner. It's still a privilege to be able to do those things for you because I love having you around and, and you're worth the effort. Yeah. You know, I, I think one of, we we're, we're t- I was talking with Amanda beforehand um, about me doing educational magic shows because I have performed in Bordentown. It's a lovely community. But one of the things that happened to me, and it wasn't in Bordentown, but I was at a, a, a show and I was telling the kids, uh, it was, it was a uh, Make Healthy Choices show. And so talking to kids about making healthy choices, especially saying no to drugs and alcohol. And, and I would always relate it back to my family and say, I, I want my kids to make healthy choices because I love my kids so much and I would be heartbroken and devastated if something happened to them. And, and, uh, and, and that's, you, you, should, you should make those choices too. And uh, a kid came up to me after show and said, uh, I, you know, not every kid is loved by their parents. And I said, I was shocked. I said, what, what are you talking about? And he said, well, my, my parents don't love me. My, my dad ran out. I never met him. My mom is in, is in prison because of drugs. And so they don't love me. And I, I was wow. devastated and really blown away. But then we, we started talking and I found out that he was living with his grandparents. And so we talked about that and the fact that his grandparents did love him. And, you know, so we were able to resolve the conversation by helping him realize that, that he was loved. And from that moment on, and I wish I remembered his name because it would give, give him credit. Uh, from that moment on, I always talked about, uh, you know, you're, you're loved by your families and not only the, the, the family that you live with and it doesn't matter what, what it looks like. But also by your your school family and, and and the people that you choose to have as your family, and um, yeah, that was just a moment. You, you know, talking about your book just made me think about that moment. It was a long time ago, but it was a really powerful moment. Yeah, and it's an important one because you're right. Not all families look the same. Not everybody's experiences have been the same. I hope I tried in the book to leave it open to some interpretation, meaning it doesn't have to be a parent speaking to a child. It could be, you know, a grandparent speaking to a child or mm-hmm. a caregiver or even a nanny or a friend of the family mm-hmm. because there are all different kinds of people that love children, you know, that love the children that are in their lives, and it doesn't mean you have to necessarily be biologically related to them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, it was being the author of, uh, of children's books something that you always aspired to, always dreamed of? No, that's actually an interesting story. I, I always knew I wanted to write. I never imagined myself writing children's books, although I read a ton of them. I, I always loved books, and I loved reading to my children when they were little. So, But it hadn't occurred to me to write children's books. I actually started out writing fiction. I wrote three novels, um, and they were awful. All of them. Uh, I still think if I if I dug them up and read them, I would I would still agree that they are terrible. Um, so it's good that they never got published because I think I'd be really embarrassed right now. Um, and you know, I think as a writer, one of the challenges figuring out your genre. You know, like what should you be writing? Because I don't think it's the same for everyone. Mm-hmm. And I know some people write in many different you know formats, but for me, I think perhaps I just wasn't cut out for fiction. And so I started you know, thinking, playing around with other things. And I started writing personal essays and I wrote slogans and I wrote greeting cards. I mean, I wrote all sorts of things. And one night I actually had a dream about a children's book and I thought, well, that's odd because I don't write them. And I kind of just ignored it. And it kept coming back, you know, during the day it would pop into my head and I would think, well, that's not a terrible idea. So eventually I wrote it down and I thought, well, 
maybe I'll submit it somewhere and just see what happens. And so that kind of got the ball rolling and I started writing more children's books and, you know, the original one still hasn't gotten picked up, but this one did. And, and now I feel like it's kind of a perfect fit for me because I've always loved children and I do love children's books. And I'm really looking forward to getting out and meeting children, you know, doing school visits, maybe Barnes and Noble, read alouds, you know, things like that. I think that's going to be so much fun. Mm -hmm. Now we should mention that if there never was a you is uh, being published by our friends over at Familius and it's available for pre-order right now. It's actually going to be released on March 1st. So there's still a few weeks that, the, that you have left to pre-order it. And that's always fun having something, um, Ship to you the day that it's available. I always think that that's that's really cool being one of the first ones to receive a book. Yes, I agree. And Familius has been absolutely wonderful. It's, it's such a great publisher. I feel very lucky to work with them. Brooke Jordan, uh, the editor there, is fantastic. She literally picked my book out of the slush pile, so I will forever be grateful to her. And you know Kate Farrell, who's just amazing. Mm -hmm. She manages to be, you know, the director of marketing, but also just everybody's biggest supporter. She's really in everyone's corner. And I don't know how one woman does so much amazing work, but she really does. That's fantastic. Yeah, we love the folks at Familias. We've had so many wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, authors on from Familias. And also we've had the, the CEO and creative director as well. Tell me what... Can, as a as a parent and as somebody that I'm sure read to your kids many many books, what do you see as the biggest benefit to taking time and and reading to your kids? Well, uh, well it's a tough one. I'm going to have to give you two because there's okay. so many. Um, but I, obviously, the number one is just family time. You mm -hmm. know, I think any time that everybody unplugs their devices and just sits together and focuses on something, you know, it's just quality time that you can't put a price on. That's wonderful. But I also think that there's a lot of natural things that, that come to you when you read. You know, you learn about vocabulary. You learn about grammar. You learn so much. I read so much as a child, and I had such an easy time in a lot of classes that some people really struggled in because I think I just picked it up from, from reading so much. I think as you read, you learn what sentences are supposed to sound like and what the flow sounds like and what's a good sentence and what's a bad one. And so I think there's so much to be learned from reading together. Yeah. It, yeah. It's, I, I also loved reading and, um, I grew up in a town, I grew up in a town and at a time where the, the school system that I was in was they were experimenting with a new way to teach kids how to write. And they didn't, teach us formal English grammar. And I didn't realize that until I went to a classical high school <laughs> and was trying to learn Latin wow. and I couldn't, t you know, break down a <laughs> sentence. But I could, I could absolutely write and I w could write very well. And uh, I, I could write a sentence. I, I couldn't break it down and, and tell you what was what. Um, so for me, that, that, that particular way of teaching, uh, worked for me. It didn't work for enough people because they don't do it anymore. <laughs> more but it it it, it really um it re really re it revolved in a lot of ways around reading and just you know just doing that and the more you read and you know like you were saying get that rhythm uh, how things are supposed to sound and, and how words are put together to form sentences and paragraphs was uh, really beneficial for me Absolutely. And I think another advantage of reading is it forces you to use your imagination. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's something that's not done enough anymore, you know, with all of the devices we have sure. and all the screens. And, you know, I think it, it makes you not use your imagination as much. And, and I love to see a kid sit down with a book or even sit down with some blocks or anything that doesn't require, you know, a charger. I like to see kids with the old fashioned toys using their imaginations. Uh, one of my favorite children's books was Harold and the Purple Crayon mm. because it's all about imagination. And I think that that's something that's really important to me is, is trying to get my kids to use their imagination because it just opens up a whole new world for you. Yeah, absolutely. Now, other than Harold and the Purple Crayon, are, are there other authors or other children's books that inspired you? There's so many children's books now that I've been reading that are, that are so good. Like The Day the Crayons Quit is so clever. Um, and there's a book called What Do You Do With a Problem? And there's also a book by the same author called What Do You Do With an Idea? And those books are amazing. I think they really inspire kids 
to try to figure out, you know, how to deal with the curveballs that life throws at you and, and how to make something good out of them. And I really like that. That's such an important lesson for us. And we talk a lot about that on the show. Um, just, just helping kids understand that failure is a part of life and failure is just the beginning of, of finding, uh, finding a solution to a problem and, um, that, that we don't need to be afraid of, of falling down and, and trying different things. Absolutely. I think that's absolutely true. I have a book that's titled, um, Try Again, Fail Better. And that always makes me laugh, but it's true. You know, mm-hmm. I think you, you have to keep trying. And that's how it was with me, you know, for the writing. Mm-hmm. I, I kept trying things and, you know, I would get rejected and I would think, okay, maybe I wasn't meant to be a writer. But it's not that I wasn't meant to be a writer. I just wasn't writing the right thing. Mm-hmm. So I think you just have to keep getting back up and trying again. Well, I know it's still a few weeks before your your debut book is is officially published and available at Amazon and Barnes & Noble and, of course, through Familius. Uh, is it too early to ask if you're working on um, a, a new project? Oh, definitely not. I have a whole bunch of manuscripts that I'm I'm working on, and I'm actually, you know, hoping to get published. So one at a time. But I have uh, one that I think is kind of funny that I'd really like to see. And interestingly, it's sort of on the same theme. It's about you know how parents loving their children, but it's more of a, a funny spoof about you know all the things that will protect our children from. So I'm hoping to find a home for that soon. Super, super. Now, before you go, I do want to ask you, you were talking about the benefits of of kids, of families coming together and spending time reading. Do you ever take a moment now that, you know, still it's a couple weeks away before if there never was a you is is released? Do you Do you ever find yourself imagining uh, a, a family sitting down together and, and reading this book together? Yeah, so I have a lot of friends with children, and, and they've been super supportive, and, you know, they keep telling me, oh, I pre-ordered your book, and, and every time I hear that, it, you know, I imagine them with their child and, you know, at home reading it, and it really, it makes it all worth it. It really just makes me happy to think about all these people that I love, spending time with the people that they love, and I hope that they'll have some real quality time together reading the book. Awesome. So tell us your website, where folks can go to uh, connect with you and to um, find out what's going on in your career. Okay. Uh, my website is com, and there's a link on there also to my Facebook author page. I have a blog on the website. Um, it's partially about parenting, which is partially about life. Uh, there's also a page there that has links to where you can pre-order the book so that I hope people will come check it out. Awesome. Well, the name of the book, again, is If There Never Was a You. It will be released on March 1st. It's available for pre-order right now on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble. And uh, it's it's from our folks, our friends over at Familius. We've been talking tonight to Amanda Rowe. Amanda, thank you so much for being part of the show. Thank you so much for having me. It was great to talk to you, Jed. In just a moment, Nadine Popa will be here. But before she joins us... I would like to invite you to visit our website, readingwithyourkids.com, where you can download a free digital version of my latest picture book. It's called Love That I Matter to You. Love That I Matter to You. I wrote it specifically for your kids to read to you. You know how there are some books that your kids just love to have you read to them over and over and over again? Well, you are going to love having your kids read this book to you over and over and over again because it's designed to give your kids a chance to tell you just how important you are to them. And in giving them an opportunity to do that is really, really important. Check it out. Get a free digital download by visiting readingwithyourkids.com. So here I am in beautiful York, Pennsylvania, walking around the Wise Haven Event Center. Very fancy place, I must say. And I, 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 I see my favorite children's library my favorite school librarian is here nadine popper nadine how are you i'm great Jed. thank you i'm really excited nadine was on the show earlier talking to us about her weenies and bikinis book you have uh, the, uh, a new book out since since we had that uh, chat tell us about frank stinks well frank stinks is another wiener dog book and Frank is the dog that loves to roll in a stinky spot, but he's always smelly, so he has a hard time making friends. 
so he has to decide, is he going to break this habit so he can make friends or not? So um, it does have a really cute ending, a uh, surprise ending, actually. Awesome, awesome. Frank Stinks. Uh, my wife could probably write a book that says Jed Stinks, but we're not going to get into that. That's it, it, there, there are some dogs who just love to find that stink and roll around in it. Yes, that's absolutely correct. <laughs> I, I, I don't understand it myself, um, but I guess there are some things that aren't meant to be understood. That is that is absolutely true. I don't get it either. I don't know what it is. Now, as a children's librarian, are there any particular books that the kids, my friends at your school, and Nadine is, is the school librarian at an awesome, awesome school in Reading, Pennsylvania, and the, the kids are great. What really kind of sparks their imagination at the library? Well, let's see. There's... There is such a variety, but I would have to say the most books that are in circulation for the elementary age right now are your graphic novels. Ah. So like your Baby Mouse, and there's um, for the for the. Yeah, maybe fourth, fifth graders, or you got your Bone and your Amulet series in graphic novels. Mm-hmm. But the graphic novels tend to really go. I guess that kind of makes sense because we are so visual these days with all the different screens and everything mm-hmm. uh, that, yeah, it makes sense that the kids are really gravitating towards the graphic novels. Yes. Um, and I think it's also because of the limited text um, because children will they'll print shop. Um, they will first pick up a book based on cover, mm-hmm. but then the next thing they do is they open it and they look for print size and wow. the amount of white space and the amount of illustration. So if they see um, a nice balance of that, uh, then they tend to gravitate towards that book. Um, the chapter book for that age group, um, there are some kids that will read like ch- complete chapter books, but there's more students that will read the graphic novels at this age. Mm-hmm. You know, that kind of makes sense as, as I'm creating different marketing materials, whether it's for a book or for it's one of my educational magic shows, the, the kind of advertising experts always tell me you want to have a lot of white space because that, that way it's more likely that the adults will read it. Yes, and it's um, visually more appealing and less threatening to especially a struggling reader. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, and that's one of the things that, that I was guilty of as a parent when my son was younger. It frustrated me that that's, you know, he wouldn't read anything without pictures in it. And I didn't have a full appreciation of the fact that he was still reading. Even though he was reading a graphic novel, he was still reading. Absolutely. And, um, you know, even... It- it, and it all really depends on what their friends are reading, too, because they will influence each other a lot. Uh-huh. So if they have a really good friend who is reading a chapter book, and they more than likely will then gravitate towards that, but only when they're ready. Mm-hmm. Um, I think parent influence um, is a big part of it, but I think at that age it's more peer. Mm-hmm. So like you said, it's, as long as they're reading... Let's not worry too much about what type of reading that they're doing, Mm -hmm. as long as they're reading. Absolutely. And I understand you have a new book coming out in 2019. Can you give us a little sneak preview of it? Sure. Um, It actually has nothing to do with wiener dogs. I went outside my comfort zone this time, (laughs) and I picked a uh, manuscript about a predator-prey relationship between a porcupine and a fisher. A fisher kit is actually like a weasel-type animal. And they are, the fisher is one of the only known predators of the porcupine. So I created a humorous but factual picture book on the predator prey relationship between those two animals. Cool, very cool. And that's going to be spring of 2019? Yes, and it's um, being published by Blue Whale Press. Wonderful. And um, can we get you to make, make a commitment to come back on the show and tell us about that book when it's ready? Absolutely. I'd be love, uh, enjoy to. Awesome. Nadine, I want you to tell all my friends over at your school that I said hi. Please be sure to join us for the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Our guest will be Mara James. Mara will be here. We hope you're going to be here with us, too. Hey, if you are the author of a great children's book, we would love to have you on the show. You know... When you write a children's book, whether you publish it independently or you publish by one of the giant publishing houses, 
marketing the book really does fall on you. You, you may have a little bit of support from uh, your traditional publisher, but really the job that becomes your job to celebrate your book. And a great way to celebrate your book is by being a guest on the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Being a guest, it's fun, it's easy, and it doesn't cost you a thing and gives you an opportunity to tell the world about your great children's book. To be a guest, just go to our website, readingwithyourkids.com, sk- click on the contact button, let us know about your great book, we'll let you know the next easy steps. We absolutely want to thank our guests for being here today, Amanda Rowe and Nadine Popper. Thanks so much for being here, and of course, we want to thank you. Thank you so very much for taking the time. First off, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, subscribe to the show, whether it's on iTunes or iHeartRadio or Apple Podcast or Stitcher Radio or Radio.com or wherever you find your podcast. Thank you so much for subscribing to us. And thank you so much for taking the time to read with your kids. Every time you do that, you make the world a better place. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast.